Hello, hello. Can, can you guys hear me? Perfect, sort of. Okay, so I need some exercise in the morning. There are a bunch of people standing there and there are a bunch of free seats. So everyone who has a free seat on his right or left hand towards the center of the meeting of the recession room, you guys should move. <laughs> Let's see how many people are moving. <laughs> I should have probably said that the end goal should be that there are free seats on the side. <laughs> and everyone gets a seat. <laughs>
right, guys. So I don't see many free chairs. So if you still want to get seated, this keynote will be streamed to the, meet, uh, to the session rooms, which are downstairs, both of them. It's supposedly working, right? So uh, yeah, if you can't fit here, you can still go downstairs. It's five minutes past 9 a.m., so let's get this thing officially started. So welcome, everyone, to Developer Conference 2015. Uh, welcome to this really nice venue of Brno University of Technology. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad that we can use this uh, great university campus here and many meeting rooms, many session rooms. As you've probably realized, we have way more talks than last year. We've pretty much doubled the number of talks and sessions. So I really hope that you will enjoy it. Uh, my name is Rade Vokal. I'm one of the organizers. So if you need anything during the conference, I'll be probably really busy. But you can always grab me and talk to me. A uh, couple bookkeeping things. Uh, you guys have probably seen that uh, we have a party tonight. The party is available for everyone, but there is a limited number of people we can squeeze in. So there is a Red Hat booth right in front of this lecture room. Pick the ticket there. Uh, that Red Hat room is run by our HR people, so they will probably need some email and your CV and things like this from you. <laughs> This is not the only venue or not, not only uh, building that we're using. Uh, all the other talks are in the e-room. And that's this direction over there. And that's where also we have some refreshments for you ready. They're, they will open at 10 AM. There will be coffee, snacks, and, and sandwiches, and things like this. So that's the way how you find it, because there will be a bunch of people running there right after this keynote. And. Uh, that's, that's probably everything for the beginning. Uh, enjoy the conference. Please keep this room clean as, pos as, as much as possible. Don't leave any trash behind. Don't bring any food inside, please. And with that, I would like to welcome Tim, uh, my friend, boss. Uh, <laughs> what else? <laughs> You've got to start before you get yourself right. in trouble. <laughs> OK. So, Tim, it's all yours. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Radek. Yeah, Radek and, and the whole crew in the Brno office did an outstanding job putting this together. So just another round of applause for them, because they're really awesome guys. OK, Dobredano, Brno. And I want a special welcome to the Django girls. It's always good to have a lot of new people participating in open source. So the more the better. You're all welcome here. So uh, this is only a 20-minute talk, and I'm probably likely to get pushed off the stage. Uh, so I'm going to do this and try not to be too quick. But, um, and what I'm going to talk about, unlike what this was advertised, is I'm not going to talk about the future of Red Hat. I'm going to talk about the future of you guys. What's your role in transforming the information technology uh, world? It, because honestly, there's never been a more exciting time to be in computers and to be in this business. So it's a... It's a great time and it's an exciting time. And so what I want to talk about is what can you do? Why should you care? And what's your role in um, open source? So I've been in this game for almost 30 years. Pretty shocking how time flies. And you know the pace of technology back when we started Unix in the, in the, uh, in the old days, look at, I'm not going to go over a bullet on this slide, but we used to do things like a new version of the NFS protocol every five years. And we thought we were awesome. But that's nothing, right? I mean, look at it today. All the, the, t the advancement of technology, the rapid rise of, you know, every day there's more and more cloud companies. There's more and more uh, big data companies. It's just exploding. And it's not just exploding in one place. It's really multidimensional. It's, it's down from the infrastructure layer to the developer layer to the uh, business analytics layer. It's just... Uh, virtually unbounded, so it's, it's a really uh, broad space of technology that we can all get involved in. And the great news is, is that open source is really leading the way for this technology innovation. And, you know, of course the reason why open source is leading it, it's because uh, the cooperation. There's no one company that could drive this broader range of innovation. It's you know, from the data layer to the storage, networking, uh, programming, and, you know, full up and down the stack. And that's why open source is, is taking over. And in fact, 
open source is the leading technology in underlying a lot of these cloud offerings and, and a lot of the new waves of, of innovation. And so that's where, you know, that's what we're here for, right? We're here for open source. Anybody awake? Heinz, how about you? Are you here for open source? All right, good man. <laughs> okay. So what I want to talk about is uh, talk about some of the pieces and how they fit together because a lot of people work on you know, their one little piece, so they have their one interest in one area, and it's sometimes hard to know how, do, how does it all connect, you know, how do you put these pieces together, and what does what you do, how do you fit into this? Because, you know, a lot of people look at it and say, hey, I'm not working on OpenStack, so this cloud stuff isn't me, right? What am I doing here? But that's not true. What I want to talk about is how this requires so many different pieces, and I'm only going to talk about the bottom half of the stack, Mark Little, who's going to come after me, he's going to talk about the top half of the stack. So uh, what we want to do is say, how do all these pieces fit together, and how are you guys together driving this exciting wave of innovation and technology? So what we're going to do is, we're going to spend a lot of time on this one slide, but we're just going to walk through it one piece at a time to try to see how all these pieces fit together. And I'm going to try to start rather from the bottom up. Um, and so first off, at the Linux space, um, you know, some people used to think, oh, Linux is done, it's over. And, but that's not true at all because the rate, the number of um, changes and enablers that are in Linux for, for, the, for these new um, flexible cloud technologies, it's huge. So, for example, in, you know, the first thing I list on each um, of these um, uh, caption lines is, what's the t um, product and the open source technology behind it here at Red Hat? And so the first is Fedora and RHEL is obviously our Linux-based uh, foundation um, and also the CentOS distribution. And so what, what are some of the main roles of, of the uh, underlying operating system? It's hardware auto-discovery uh, is a key thing. Like a lot of it today is people want to be able to just plug and play. Just plug in your stuff, get it to work. People at different layers don't want to have to worry about all the the low-level configuration. So it's all about plugging in hardware, having things automatically discovered. The, the Linux kernel and, and the Linux layer, it's really about isolation and security because it's really a multi-tenant world. You have multiple apps running on the same operating system, of course. And so you've got geniuses like Dan Walsh here making sure that Coke and Pepsi aren't, are, you know, if you're running two different competitors' applications on the same system, that they're, they're not messing with each other. Um, application runtimes are huge, so we have um, a bunch of developers and Radix team who are doing, you know, Perl, Ruby, Python, MongoDB, all these databases, languages, and things like that. That's uh, an underlying technology of the operating system. But also another major change that, that's really key and important at the operating system level, it's APIs for configuration. Because the old days were, people, so you'd have some, you know, uh, long-bearded Unix guru sitting behind a, a server trying to micro-optimize it forever. Today, people aren't going to waste their time with that. They want to have things scriptable, Puppet, Ansible, things like that to be able to configure your, your, um, your systems. And people want to be able to update this really quickly because it's all about new, fast advancing. So it's no longer, don't look at it as, it, it's about automation. That's really the key at, at this layer. Um, Software-defined storage is really a, a fast-moving new technology, and so this is manifested in things like Ceph and Gluster. So it's how do we take commodity hardware, how do we take just plain disks and turn them into uh, broad distributed systems for, for data storage so that you don't have to do things like spend you know, thousands and thousands of dollars for expensive proprietary hardware. So you're going to see here a theme in this is that a lot of it's replacing formerly proprietary expensive hardware with commodity software based. So um, storage driven technology is a key piece of that. And there's things like it, uh, the usage of thin provisioning. You want to be able to uh, do this really quickly. So if you're bringing up uh, large numbers of virtual machines, large numbers of containers, each of them, each of these applications environments needs their own storage. And so through these um, technologies like thin provisioning, you want to be able to really rapidly uh, configure the storage for it. And as with everything, you want to be able to scriptively uh, configure with scripts and automation so that you don't have to manually sit, sit behind it and tune it. 
One of the most uh, fast-paced and exciting new areas in open source development is in SDN, which stands for Software Defined Networking. So there's projects like Open vSwitch and Open Daylight, uh, Neutron, which is the networking portion of OpenStack, which is all about how do we dynamically um, connect the dots. So if you have um, systems with containers or virtualized guests, how do you set up virtual private networks between them? How do you br do bridging and bonding between systems to be able to dynamically connect these systems? It's a really complex and fast-moving set of uh, new technologies, a lot of innovation in this space. And this is driving what's called NFV, which is Network Function Virtualization. And it, this is along the trend of replacing formerly proprietary expensive hardware with commodity equipment. So a lot of the major network providers, a lot of the major um, tel telephone, telephony, telco providers, those large businesses, they're transitioning to using open source based, based technologies, things like OpenStack, Open OVS, Open vSwitch. Uh, they want real-time technology. So this is really driving an exciting new wave of uh, use cases and innovation. Now we'll look at what we call infrastructure as a service. This is how you, previously we talked more, the left column was compute network and storage. So this middle tier is our control plane. This is how we put all the pieces together. And so there's several different ways that we do that together. There's uh, Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization and the Open Source Overt project. This is for um, data center virtualization. It's to be able to have, it's based on KVM. And it's a method to be able to have um, large numbers of virtualized guests configured on a single system. And it has a lot of complex policies and scheduling and, and things like that to make it really um, easy to use and flexible. We also have together OpenStack, which is, uh, we have the, a distribution called RDO. And OpenStack is really about uh, compute agility. It's how do we take the network, storage, and compute services and to be able to dynamically configure them. So OpenStack is really about the ability to do private clouds, to be able to enable businesses, universities, uh, and uh, developers to be able to have their own cloud platforms. That's what OpenStack's all about. But OpenStack uh, is getting a lot of excitement, a lot of buzz, but it would not work without Linux, software-defined networking, software-defined storage, and all the runtimes. So you see how all these pieces are starting to put together. And as with it before, it's system management is really the key piece of this. You know, often we as developers, we just focus on the core low-level features. And we, you know, system management is often an afterthought, right? It's like someone else will configure this thing. I just have to create some little API, you know, let someone else worry about it. But that's what's changing now. That's one of the, the new transformative roles. You notice in every one of these slides I talk about their scriptable configuration because you want to be able to have all these things put together dynamically through scripts, APIs, and things like uh, puppet scripts for configuration. So every, you know, if we're looking for how do we together transform the industry, it's to not just pay attention to your feature, but consider how it how, you know, plays as part of a broader solution and h how this is going to be configured because that's what's going to really drive the adoption of the technology. Next layer, um, at the, plat the next layer we call platform as a service. This is for developers, the, the high level portion of, of our stack here at Red Hat and our community interaction. And so for, and this is technologies like JBoss and OpenShift. And, and this is really geared for how do developers uh, have agility? How do they quickly develop their applications? How do they quickly deploy them? Most of the developers, Mark will tell you, and he's going to go into detail on this part of the diagram, so I'm not going to do that. But Mark will say, all that crap that Tim talked about, he doesn't want to have to worry about that. You know, he doesn't want to have to worry about compute, network, and storage. He just wants to be able to do his business logic, his business analytics, to get things going to quick, to run it on multi-platforms. And, which is great. So, um, you know, we're each forming complementary layers. So there's a lot of uh, work for everybody to get involved. Okay, so, and then uh, big data is an, a huge uh, emerging trend. So there's things like Hadoop, which is uh, ways to do analytics of large data sets. And what we're doing with uh, big data 
is how do we make it integrated and easy to configure in with the rest of the system? So things like there's uh, pieces in OpenStack which are um, used to uh, make it easy to spin up, to configure and deploy um, Hadoop database, Hadoop analytics services. So it's how do we perform higher level abstractions that use the low level system capabilities. And containers, uh, you're going to hear, uh, a, there's a lot of presentations here about containers, and containers is a new wave of technology which is able to have multi-tenancy on the same system, uh, to be able to have isolation, to be able to have uh, simpler packaging and configuration of how you deploy applications. So it's really a new deployment mechanism, um, and it has a lot of flexibility. And so containers is heavily Linux-based, and so containers runs on Linux. Then all, containers also have the same needs as virtual machines for software-defined networking, software-defined storage, compute services. So you can see that all these pieces, they really are connected together. And... Uh, also, we, there's um, DevOps is another key theme. So it's how do we rapidly develop applications? How do we have life cycles where we can go from development phase to test phase to production phase? How do we quickly deploy, configure? How do we have things like registries where you can find these services? How can you um, validate the authenticity of what you're installing? So this is a we have um, this satellite is our product offering, but there's a lot of tools like Foreman, Jenkins, Puppet, Garrett, and so on, which enable the application developers to have self-service means of building and deploying their application suite. And also, at the higher level, and this is something that's been uh, new for Red Hat uh, over, it, over a year ago, is we have um, an acquisition of a company called Manage IQ. And Manage IQ is all about cloud orchestration. And so Red Hat has, in our true open source spirit and culture, we've open sourced all the technologies for Manage IQ, and our product offering for that is called CloudForms. And what CloudForms does, it's a higher level cloud management console. It's, so what it enables you to do is take a look at across your clouds. You can have... A, it, it, it um, provides services what we call hybrid cloud because you might, for example, have some of your applications running on Amazon EC2. You might have some of your cloud services running in-house on your own um, private cloud. You might have some services running in, in Google's cloud, Rackspace and the like. And so a lot of um, sites and administrators want to be able to have a high level, uh, a single pane of glass where you can view all of those services. You can do things like set up policies for who's allowed to run VMs on which machines. You can do things like monitor utilization, chargeback. You can do things like have compliance checks to make sure that all of your systems are running the um, up-to-date version of, of the, uh, the operating system and other software. So you can see that it's really uh, high-level cloud orchestration. So what we've got is from low level, from the hardware level, all the way up to the high-level uh, orchestration layer. But this doesn't, this, you know, this is, what you can see here, this is a, it's a beautiful vision, right? It's a lot, you know, you dynamically spin up the hardware, um, dynamically find your services, and it, you know, it all just magically works. But that's, it doesn't just magically work because there's a lot of uh, integration, gluing all the pieces together, connecting all the dots. And so that's where you guys come in. And so it's through it's the beauty of open source. It allows each and every one of you to participate in any of these dimensions, any of these projects, and it just doesn't happen without you. And so what I have here in the rest of the slide deck is to some examples of what are some ways that you can become part of this. You know, how, how have we connected some of these dots? And because it's all about how do we connect these together. And so... I just got the five-minute warning, so I'm not even going to be able to get through all of these in detail, but just some example. There are things I'm gonna, uh, within uh, the Linux operating system, so there's been work within systemd in order to be able to make it container-based, to be able to have, uh, to take advantage of systemd services for logging and, and being able to um, control uh, processes and the like. 
uh, the Anaconda installer has been changed to, to include container enablement. Uh, things like open LMI has been led here out of Brno, and this is a way of having uniform system management APIs that are um, that do things like storage, networking, compute, user policies. So that's just one example of ways that there have been uh, programmable APIs that enable the higher level orchestration through things like uh, Puppet and Cloud Forms and, and Rev and OpenStack. Um, Libvert is our virtualization abstraction layer. That has been modified to, to include plumbing for containers as well as virtualized guests. Uh, Dan Walsh is going to be leading some talks about SE Linux that talk about how is our platform optimized for isolation and security and containment of, of virtualized guests. Um, I'm skipping through these really quickly. The, uh, there's a number of people from the LVM and Device Mapper Volume Management team here. These guys have put in a lot of work to be able to make it really quick and rapid to uh, configure new, new um, volumes to be able to quickly spin up guests and things like that. And there's also been, uh, at this layer, uh, device optimizations for storage to make it quick to, for the use cases of containers and virtualized guests. Gluster and Ceph. Uh, Ceph is a, one of the, a recent acquisition for Red Hat within this past calendar year. When we, opened, when we acquired them, we, they used to have some, although most of it was open source, they had some a proprietary uh, management GUI called Calamari. And so Red Hat, uh, in our spirit, again, open source that. Why? Because we really believe that community engagement is the best model to move these technologies forward. And so there's some people here from the Ceph team as well as there are members from the Gluster team. And Gluster is our, um, our distributed file system offering, which is uh, well integrated with uh, OpenStack and other, other use cases. On, uh, on the Rev front, there's Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization has been increasingly integrating with a lot of the OpenStack services. So that the goal here is that you can have a common environment that you can run the more uh, dynamic, agile OpenStack environments, or you can run the more highly optimized Red Hat Enterprise virtualization environments. So it's, it's, again, it's more about how do we integrate these technologies together to have a better uh, customer solution. OpenStack, one of the key exciting areas is NFV, Network Function Virtualization. So there's been a lot of work like at the KVM layer to enable that. Uh, Karen Noel's team and others, so things like having uh, large, uh, huge pages to be able to have large um, data sets, things like uh, I.O. optimizations that are specifically tuned for the deterministic or the predictable type of workloads that are needed by these network and, te and telephone providers. The, uh, the, the identity team, so we have, this is things like SSSD, uh, Kerberos and the like, so you, what you want, if you have a whole system, you want to be able to have things like single sign-on. You want it to be able to have a single administrator account that you can configure your storage and your um, user identities and, and all these things. So this team, the identity team, has done a lot of work with across all the different boxes on the prior slide to say how, how can we make a, both a secure and an easy-to-configure system. Uh, manage IQ, we talked about that already since I'm getting the gong here just about... And so the point is, is that as we're transforming the, the industry, it's you guys need to think that. It's it, all be part of it. We, you know, we've talked about how we've changed many of the different layers, and you, know, you guys are involved in all of that, and Mark's going to talk more about the upper part of the stack. So, but it, in order to transform as part of its definition, you have to think a little differently. You have to think not just about your box, but how does your box connect to the other boxes? And don't just think like, hey, I've got some API and let someone else worry about how do I you know, integrate with another um, subsystem. It really requires people you know, straddling the fence, becoming part of multiple subsystems and working together. Don't just assume it's somebody else's problem to get this stuff to work together because it's not. It's really ours together. And so the rate, I really believe that the rate of innovation for this is going to be proportional to how much time people spend working together across these subsystems. So with that, I'm getting booted off, but I want to thank you guys. I hope you enjoyed DevConf. 
and really use this as a way to learn about other subsystems, other technologies, to figure out how you too can become part of this transformation. Thank you. Please, you don't have to leave because uh, Mark Little is going to continue with the keynote, so please uh, stay seated and... Uh, Mark Little is going to continue with this keynote, so please stay seated and stay a while. <laughs> for a few minutes or what? I have okay all right we're gonna get going so anybody who's talking should probably stop uh, so as Tim said um, in middleware we really don't care what goes on below middleware it was really interesting to hear but no not of interest uh, so I was asked to talk about how containers are, uh, are impacting the future of Red Hat, at least from the, uh, the platform as a service uh, level on up. Um, I'm going to talk about containers, and I'll probably interchangeably use the word Docker now and then, but you know, it's, that's just an implementation of a container. Containers have been around for a long, long time. Uh, the operating system is a container. We kind of heard Tim mention that, uh, or at least touch on that before. So if I do use the word Docker, you know, try and do a mental map of this could be some other container implementation at some point in the future. Uh, something that you may have heard of, uh, hopefully you have, if you were in Red Hat and you haven't heard of this, um, then shame on, shame on you and maybe shame on us. Uh, XPaaS, so this is something that we, uh, we announced uh, over a year ago at, uh, at Java One to try and steal some thunder from uh, Mr. Ellison. <laughs> Um, and XPaaS is basically a platform as a service, but with all of our middleware components fully integrated. And it's not just throwing up EAP or BRMS or you know, Portal or whatever else onto uh, a platform as a service and just saying, job done. It's really putting them up there and making sure they are integrated, that they really are uh, greater than the sum of the individual components, that you can't see the transition when you move from doing something with business rules to doing something on, on EAP or doing something with AMQP, for instance. I'm just going to have to run through these because apparently I've been told I've got 15 minutes instead of 20. Um, this is just to give you an idea. This is a, like a desktop that you would see if you went to XPaaS, which runs on OpenShift. Uh, the idea is that you would go in there as a developer, all DevOps based obviously, and you would essentially choose a template. What kind of developer am I? Am I trying to develop something for integration? Am I try really interested in something that's going to run on an app server? And you would select one of these templates and a number of services would essentially be, uh, be swapped into your development domain and you could start using them. The IDE that, would, that comes with this would make them available and you wouldn't necessarily need to go off explicitly and say, well, now I want to do some remote in interactions. How do I do that? How do I get access to JMS, for instance? All of that would be there for you. And there may be things that you do outside the scope of this. You know, it's a template. It's not meant to kind of constrain you. So you get access to other things as and when you need to, to grow your application. This is great, but how do we do it? This is where the container stuff comes in. Uh, it's all based on containers. And then uh, something called microservices, which sit on top of containers. And I'm going to really 
focus on, uh, on the middle bits of this pyramid in the, the last 10 minutes that I have. Uh, this is how XPaaS and OpenShift work together with containers. Uh, we had, you know, Tim essentially touched on everything that we have in, uh, in the gray box here apart from software as a service. And the idea is that we have OpenShift, which obviously uh, runs on, on RHEL, and we have public and private OpenShift, and then middleware sits on top of OpenShift. So middleware, JBoss, is tightly integrated into, into OpenShift. If, if you're deploying onto public or private cloud, hybrid cloud, it's OpenShift. That takes care of all of the cloud bursting for you. So if you start private and you then need to go public uh, to get more capacity at Christmas or Easter, for instance, OpenShift does that all for you. You don't need to worry about that. You're really developing your app at the, uh, the middleware layer, and all these nice things that OpenShift provides are just happening seamlessly underneath the covers for you. So what's the impact on our projects and products of this uh, new, new wave, or not necessarily so new wave, of, of dockers, of containers? Uh, all of our projects are looking now to adopt Docker. It pushes quite a nice distribution mechanism. If any of you are, you know, Java developers, you'll understand when I say, you know, Maven, download the world. Uh, you don't need to worry about that as a developer or as a, as a builder of your, your projects. With Docker, the idea is we, on, we obviously have a single Docker instance that encapsulates everything. I don't need to worry if a particular uh, new version of Log4j has come out that might break uh, the previous version of, uh, of EAP that I was working with because the version of EAP that I get comes in a Docker distribution and everything I need to run that version is in Docker and it's, it's kind of uh, immutable. XPaaS comes as a natural byproduct of this so the, the focus as I said on XPaaS and on Docker and on containers is, is kind of one-to-one. -one. Everybody is focused on this and making sure that if we're, doc if we're containerized we're going to be XPASized. But Docker or containers doesn't equal microservices by itself and blindly approaching services isn't really going to benefit anyone. Uh, there are lots of unknowns. Ten minutes. I've only been going five. Okay. Uh, and there's lots of architectural planning, lots of changes that are going to be needed in our projects and in our products. Uh, across the stack. You know, Tim mentioned some. Uh, there are still lots of things going on at, at the middleware and the open shift level. It's a very, very active area for anybody uh, to get involved in. I know many people in this room are involved in, in one or more of the things I'm going to uh, touch on. So microservices. Uh, hopefully many people have heard of microservices. This is a quote from, uh, from Fowler in March 2014. He didn't come up with the term but you know, the, the key bar parts are the bits in black. Microservices is all about designing software applications as suites of independently deployable services. Uh, conveniently, he says, there's no precise definition of the architectural style. Uh, I think it's a bit of a cop-out, personally. Uh, and, it, and it pushes automated deployment and intelligence in the endpoints. Uh, he's definitely an, an anti-ESB type guy. Um, I think uh, you know, ESBs definitely have a place to, pl uh, to play in this area, which is good, because you know, we have a pretty good integration suite ourselves. This is a you know, pictorial representation of essentially what he's saying. You have over here your, your old monolithic type application where all of your capabilities for your application are in a single machine. You can think of it as an operating system, you can think of it as a container. Uh, but then with microservices, you, you take the hopefully orthogonal components of that application, you break them out into, in, into individual services. And those individual services would very naturally these days go into uh, individual containers. But it's really just SOA. Uh, there's a lot that you can go and read up on microservices. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to touch on it. But, but if you go to InfoQ, for instance, you'll find lots of articles on microservices. It's SOA done right. There are a number of uh, things over the years that have had SOA attached to them that aren't really SOA. But microservices, uh, if the only thing that comes out of the term microservices, in my view, is that people understand it as how to do SOA, then that's great. I don't care whether we call it Spock, for instance, but it's just SOA. And obviously, Red Hat has a lot to say and do in the SOA space, particularly with uh, you know, our Fuse um, product line and projects. 
Um, Kubernetes, this is another thing that has come along in the last uh, year or so. It's a project from Google. I'm not really going to touch on this. I know there are uh, presentations. There's at least one presentation on Kubernetes. Uh, the reason I mention this is because it's, it's key now to what's going on in, in the OpenShift re-architecture with OpenShift 3. And Red Hat is a, a key contributor to Kubernetes. Uh, go along to the presentation later on if you want to hear more about it. Uh, it impacts middleware as well. Uh, this is a Kubernetes architecture, which I'm not going to have time to talk about. Uh, the reason it impacts middleware is for a project called uh, Fabrigate. So Fabrigate has been around, uh, actually it was going before Red Hat acquired uh, the FuSource uh, team um, three, almost three years ago now. Uh, it was called Fabric back then. And Fabric was essentially uh, starting to look uh, like a, a platform as a service, at least uh, from a middleware, from a pure Java middleware perspective. What we've been doing over the last year or so is unifying the work that's going on in Fabric 8 and, and OpenShift 3. Many of the things that Fabric 8 had started to, to do uh, were being duplicated in OpenShift and in OpenShift 3 and uh, also with things that OpenShift 3 was adopting, uh, such as Kubernetes. We're simplifying that extremely now. So Fabricate V2, which is, is a work in progress and should be out any time real soon now, uh, will, um, will look very different uh, internally to Fabricate V1. It's going to be closely tied to OpenShift 3. When you're deploying middleware, onto uh, a cloud now, essentially onto OpenShift. You deploy it onto Fabricate, and Fabricate takes care of all of, the, all of the integration with OpenShift 3. So we don't need to actually worry about any changes. Hopefully, in future, that happen with OpenShift 3. Fabricate will take care of all of those. And as a result, deploying onto Linux and non-Linux environments <coughs> will be uniform. You won't have to worry again, am I deploying onto Windows? Am I deploying onto AIX? Am I deploying onto HPOPs? It really will not matter. The, uh, you will just be deploying, and that's it, full stop. But microservices, it, it's a lot of hype at the moment. OK, um, I've got five slides left. Um, it's a lot of hype at the moment. Uh, again, this is a, a quote. Um, I can't remember who I took it from. It's off InfoQ. But essentially, it says, if you are building big balls of mud, which is a monolithic architecture that you really don't understand, that has uh, lots of interdependencies, and if you, you know, if you change an API somewhere in this big ball of mud, everything breaks, then de breaking it apart and trying to factor it out as individual services or microservices, why do you think it's going to make it any, any of a nicer architecture? If it's a big ball of mud as a monolith, it's probably going to end up as lots of independent big balls of mud or smaller balls of mud that connect together. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done to actually make microservices work really well. And essentially that, that work is things that we have been doing as an industry for a number of years under the guise of, uh, of SOA. So we may, you know, we do this a number of times in the last 30 years. We may be sort of trying to reinvent the wheel here. Um, I hope within Red Hat, you know, we, we try not to do that as much as other groups. Uh, so we'll be able to leverage a lot of the work that we've been doing over the last few years across many different uh, areas of the company and get ahead of the curve on where microservices is going. Is there anything really new in microservices? Well, we hear, certainly in the middle west space, people are now talking more and more about containerless application development, flat class paths. Um, that, that's semi-new. Uh, I actually think it's a little bit bogus, too. You can talk to me offline, because I don't really have enough time. Uh, modular containers, people think they're way too complex for many developers, whether it's OSGI or the modular services container that we have in Wildfly. Um, again, I think really if, if a container doesn't get in your way, then why should you need to worry about the fact that it may be there? We all use the operating system, and as I said before, it's a container. We don't need to worry about the fact it's doing paging or swapping or, you know, or, or red box protection underneath the covers because over the years we've got really, really good at being able to hide that stuff. So if something like Wildfly, for instance, is giving you really nice capabilities underneath the covers, if it's not getting in your way, why do you need to worry about it? Ease of use, that is something that you know, we're seeing a lot over the years. And it's not, it's not new today. Everyone's been complaining about ease of use. 
Uh, and generally, as engineers, we're actually quite bad at doing ease of use. We, we focus on what we think is ease of use for us, which is not necessarily ease of use for the 99% of people who will then use our stuff. So this is, a, this is something that's going to continue and continue, but it is an important thing that we always need to try and get right. Uh, I'll skip the rest of these. Um, there are problems with services, as I mentioned before. You know, big ball of mud, separating it up into many different microservices isn't necessarily going to give you any benefits. What about you know dependencies? If I separate uh, my monolithic architecture into mo many different services, and all of those services are dependent on each other in such a way that if one fails, the rest fail, have I really gained anything? Um, I could replicate the individual services, maybe get high availability for some of them. But again, you know, what, what's the impact of, of inter-process communication? If doing remote communication between services then causes the application to grind to a halt, again, have I, have I gained anything? So there are, these are things that we have been talking about for years with uh, service-oriented architecture. It doesn't change with microservices. Um, workflow and task management. Uh, once we've got microservices, once we've got services, how do we coordinate the tasks between them? How do we coordinate interactions? If I do X and X fails, maybe I want to do Y. How do I actually structure that? And how does this tie into ease of use? Things like JBPM, um, Drools, BRMS, they will all fit into this area. But again, this is things that the microservices <coughs> area are, are starting to think about. And I think there's a lot of work that we've been doing collectively in this audience and outside that can really be uh, brought to, to, uh, to, to bear here and, and bring some goodness to, to microservices. Things like where does state reside? Am I out of time? All right. I'll, I'll, 10 seconds. Uh, how do we handle versioning of state and services, uh, API management? And you know, how does communication occur? We hear lots of people talking about HTTP or REST. Probably REST more than HTTP. Remember that REST does not require HTTP. Uh, but again, you know, this is this is something that we need to look at, and I think things like AMQP uh, and AMQ uh, can really help with um, with microservices. App servers and microservices. I think Wildfly is actually a pretty good uh, container for microservices development. It's not heavyweight. AS7, we proved with AS7 that you don't have to make a monolithic application server. It boots in, you know, sub-seconds. Then we have a project going on called Vertex. If you know Node.js, it's polyglot version of Node.js. This is another great uh, area for microservices and containers. And in conclusion, um, I probably could have done with some more time. That's my top conclusion. Um, there are several important evolutions of middleware going on, XPAS, Internet of Things, microservices, containers, they're all being tied together. Uh, we heard Tim mention DevOps, I think it's a critical time for DevOps. And open source is most definitely leading the way into the future. And you know, if you're a Java developer, I think it's a fantastic time to be a Java developer. It's probably, since the, since the start of Java, it's probably the, the richest time that we've seen. Um, Thank you very much. Sorry I had to rush. Hi, everyone. I have just a small announcement. Guys, if you got this printed sheet, if you got this printed schedule, there is a big mistake.